talking about a little bit of pilot work that we've been doing, um, trying to improve the uh, clinical management of patients with encephalitis through uh, training of uh, undergraduates and postgraduates. And it's really it's building on a lot of the work the Brain Reflection Group has been doing more broadly uh, in this field. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Some of the stuff that we, we started doing in the UK was trying to work out where things went wrong in the management of patients with encephalitis. We've done a number of studies that have shown that often patients don't get a lumbar puncture or they get it late, and that that can result in uh, delaying the treatment uh, and finding out what the cause is. Um, and what we've tried to do is, is produce some, some simple interventions like management guidelines, which came out last year with the help of the Encephalitis Society, um, and various other bits of literature. Um, and really what we're trying to demonstrate in these slides is that we think that quite simple, pragmatic interventions can have meaningful benefits uh, in terms of changing the way patients are managed. Um, for example, uh, lumbar puncture packs, training for nurses, um, patient information leaflets, online learning resources, uh, and, and videos, um, including a YouTube video. I was, I was told by a colleague, uh, one of our educational YouTube videos has had uh, 34,000 hits. It's only up for a few months. So I went on to look at the feedback and some really lovely things. You know, thank you for posting this video, really helpful, really useful. So I'm feeling quite smug at this point when I read one comment on YouTube, which is usually full of a sort of vitriolic diatribe, and I found one comment with just two words, Ed Miliband. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm never ever going to look at YouTube videos that post every day. But in addition to that, I'm hoping to be my help. I mean, in addition to that, uh, you know, a recent paper we, we produced recently, a Sam led on, was also about in improving uh, HIV testing, getting it out there amongst neurologists and, and trying to diagnose people. So those are some of the sort of practical uh, interventions. In addition to that, um, with uh, Prof. Tom Solomon and Dr. Rachel Neen as well, we've been running for some time now the Neurological Infectious Diseases course in Liverpool, which will be in May <coughs> next year. And I have run the MRCP, um, that is the Royal College uh, PACES course for neurology uh, in the UK. And Sam has led on some uh, neurological e-learning online modules, which are free and available. Um, so that's just a sort of flavor of some of the work that we've been doing in the UK. However, <laughs> Hi, so, um, uh, so that's right, so that's some of the work um, you know, based in the UK, but of course the greatest burden of encephalitis is outside the UK, uh, it's worldwide, so um, this, top, uh, this top map is a uh, map of epidemic encephalitis, um, the most common here being Japanese encephalitis, um, uh, over 60,000 cases annually. Uh, mainly children. This is I was, I was in Nepal doing some work. Um, this is a child affected by Japanese encephalitis out in Nepal. Um, and uh, the the bottom map is the um, the map of um, HIV prevalence. And you know, as everyone will know that the HIV epidemic is centered around uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I think it says two thirds of the world's HIV positive population are in in that area. Um, and HIV can cause encephalitis in in a number of different ways. So we wanted to, um, you know, take some of the work we've, we've been doing uh, in the UK and, and see if we can uh, apply it um, with a bit more of a global focus. And uh, that's what we're going to talk more about today. So this neuroaccess is uh, what we've been uh, calling this project. Um, and we started off doing these um, little uh, revision courses for UK medical students before their before their finals to teach them all the neurology they need to know to, to pass their finals. And um, we did, uh, and all the proceeds from those courses went towards supporting neurology teaching uh, in Africa. And uh, so we um, uh, geared up to doing this pilot trip, which we got back from uh, a couple of weeks ago now, or a month ago, and um, uh, to Zambia. And this was the slide that uh, um, put together before uh, going with the sort of aims and objectives to do undergraduate, postgraduate teaching, bi-directional learning. Uh, etc. So we'll, Ben's going to talk a bit more about uh, the trip and, and what we did and uh, whether we sort of hopefully address some of those aims. Thanks. And um, we linked in with the Encephalitis Society really because we thought this project married up quite well with the work that they've been doing uh, and really expanding the society's global reach, both raising awareness of encephalitis and the society um, and trying to take some of the simple measures uh, that we've been implementing in the UK out to the areas where there's of course the greatest burden. When we got there, of course, we weren't the only doctors. Um, we quite quickly got to know of many of the other doctors in the area. Dr. Bayanassi, who had a number of, of things he could have helped us with. So um, obviously, we, obviously we, 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 
took a couple of, uh, of those uh, flyers. <laughs> and, uh, but unfortunately, there were, there were some slightly more central boxes there as well. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Omar Siddiqui there, who's a neurologist from Harvard, and Michelle, uh, also from Harvard, uh, who are out there. But the primary focus of their work and their NIH funding is, is research, but they just do as much teaching and clinical work as they can in their spare time. And uh, the whole trip was a success because he's a nice guy. But in addition to being a nice guy, that is the neurology department for Zambia. That's every neurologist in Zambia. For the 13 million people there, uh, that's everything. But despite the fact they only had a handful of doctors, they were doing some things better than we were doing in the UK. So I've talked about how my work's been about trying to get people to do the flipping lump puncture on time. Yeah. And Sam's work was about trying to get, in part, about trying to get people to do the HIV tests. We were very pleased to find that the first thing we saw when we got onto the water was this poster, Lumbar Puncture Saves Lives. And the first thing we saw in the taxi on the way to the hospital was this big poster encouraging HIV testing. So there were some things they were doing better than we're doing here in the UK. One of the things they're not doing better than the UK is what they're serving in the canteen. Um, so uh, despite the hooves and awful, we managed to uh, keep it together uh, and get on the wards and do some teaching. And uh, this is just some little shots of us teaching some psychiatry nurses, some medical students, and psychiatrists, SHOs, junior doctors. Uh, we did some sort of bedside teaching, teaching them how to do the neurological examination, and then some bits on how to interpret the signs, and then how to link what you find in terms of reflexes and other things we test for at the bedside, how to link that with what's going on in the brain. In addition to the bedside teaching, we did some uh, didactic lectures, this is Sam teaching people about uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and me showing them some, some brain scans, because they've got a couple of scanners there. And we also were very fortunate to do uh, the grand rounds there. Uh, we talked about uh, encephalitis. I focused on non-HIV encephalitis and some HIV-related uh, unopportunistic diseases. And uh, we also had a great opportunity to, to meet that the gentleman up there that's, that stood next to Sam, who actually developed one of the first HIV tests in Zambia uh, back at the start of the epidemic and was really at the forefront of diagnosing the first ever cases, uh, including the president's son. And as a consequence of making that diagnosis, the president of Zambia at that time and to this uh, day is a big advocate uh, traveling around the, the world uh, supporting, expanding, and rolling out HIV testing and treatment programs. And this is another shot where it's quite light in here. You can just see smiles. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the medical students in the final year, and, and they're really enjoying it. One of them smiling quite a lot, uh, this girl here. We didn't realize at the time, until after we took the photo, that Sam's got her arm around her at the top and I've got my arm around her at the bottom. <laughs> so she's been quite cuddled. Um, so although we spent most of our time with sort of groups of 30 to 40 medical students at a time uh, and junior doctors, we, uh, we were told about clinical officers whilst we were out there. And so rather than taking seven years to train through medical school, which is very competitive to get into, and as I say, only 30 to 40 produced a year, Clinical officer training takes 18 months to two years. And the clinical officers and the people out there in the villages, they, they function as a general practitioner, they see everything that comes to the front door, they function as a specialist in every field of medicine and surgery, uh, including, uh, including you know, caesarean sections and everything else. And they really are the primary uh, people delivering health care. And uh, we were asked by the, the, uh, the lecturer that runs their course if we'd do one of our little sessions for them. Might as well It'll be interesting for us to find out about these people. So, expecting again 30 to 40 students around the bedside, we walked into a room that looked like this. Um, and that's just how it started. Um, we got a bit too flustered and got on with teaching, but we should have taken some photos later on. That room filled up and filled up the whole way through the course until the whole of the back of the room was full of people. And we estimate there were over 150 people there. And um, that's one year's worth of people going out who will be. And they were only weeks away from finishing, and they'll be out uh, providing most of the medical care to most of Zambia, not the 30 to 40 people in the ivory tower. And they've got incredible aims. For example, it's on the back of one of their T-shirts, reaching everyone everywhere with HIV counselling and testing services. And they, that's really what they do. They're out there seeing the majority of the disease. Um, and uh, it can be interesting trying to do, you know, clinical teaching to you know have an examination to really speak. We found ourselves sort of wading out into the audience and stuff. Um, but we, we lectured them for an hour and a half. Um, and in fact, some of them enjoyed it so much that that cluster at the bottom actually stayed on afterwards uh, to, to get a bit more teaching from us. So all in all, during our, our short time there, just two weeks there, uh, we did, uh, I think, uh, 10 or 11 sessions with junior doctors, uh, five or six with the fifth years, 
uh, we did about 12 sessions with the seventh years, again, three or four sessions with the sixth years. We taught psychiatrists who are out there manage most of the neurology because there's no, no neurologists routinely on the wards, uh, psychiatric nurses, district general hospital work, and instead of clinical officers. So all in all, uh, we, we were involved in teaching and training at, uh, over 300 trainees and students in addition to doing a little bit of clinical support, including uh, clinics and, and ward referrals and stuff like that, and attending ward rounds. And uh, we actually received this letter, which, which obviously you can't read, but this is a letter from uh, Dr. Lackey, who's the, uh, the head of internal medicine there. Um, and when we told uh, Omar Siddiqui, the, the chap who was organising it for us, that we've got this letter, his jaw hit the floor, because apparently this, this man is, is impossible to impress. <laughs> and, uh, and he was very keen that he, he write a letter saying thank you very much for what we've done. Sam. Okay, so, um, you know, there's an enormous uh, burden of uh, neurological disease uh, in Zambia and in uh, similar uh, places. Um, this is, this is uh, just a photo of one of the wards on a, on a quiet day. You can see there's, you know, people overflowing. There's a sort of mattress on the floor there. Um, and, you know, all the wards were, were full of uh, cases of neurology and the, uh, uh, the greatest, uh, but a large portion of those were neurological infection. Um, HIV was extremely prevalent, so uh, over 50% of the uh, inpatients had HIV. Uh, I was in Malawi uh, a little before uh, with Tom actually um, for a, a conference and uh, in the hospital there, uh, over 80% of the inpatients had HIV. Um, but we were struck by, uh, we, we thought that um, you know, the, this would mean that um, uh, you know, all we were really seeing was uh, neurological infection kind of eclipse all other uh, diagnoses, but we were quite surprised. So, um, for example, so this lady, by the way, all these photos of patients have given their uh, permission away to be, to be, to be shown. Um, this lady is uh, looking at me having to lift up her eyelid to do so, um, because she has such a profound ptosis. She has uh, quite advanced myasthenia gravis, an autoimmune condition, which is unusual, lady on the ward. Um, the, also, I mean, in the markets, they have all these spices and various flavours. Uh, in fact, these ones here are, um, these, I think these are the fish, but these ones are caterpillars. <laughs> and we both had, had a caterpillar, they're fairly revolting. But the only, uh, the only uh, spice, if you want to call it that, to require somebody walking around the wheelbarrow is salt. And hypertension is a huge problem uh, out in Zambia, there's so lots of um, uh, um, problems related to that. This is just a photo of a poster on the wall in the psychiatric hospital. And Psychiatrist, psychiatrist, see a lot of the neurology um, uh, of the um, admissions, and this big uh, one here is alcohol use, and the, the, the two different things are male and female, male and female. So, you know, alcohol use um, uh, amongst males in particular is a huge problem. So, non-communicable diseases are becoming a, a big issue as well. But, the, but as I say, the majority of uh, the, the, the bulk of the neurological disease was related to. Uh, infection, and um, uh, um, the various sorts of encephalitis. We saw some um, some cases, for example, a, a, a 16-year-old boy who had some kind of meningoencephalitis and, and had lost the vision in both eyes. No idea what that was to do with, um, and it would have been great to have been able to investigate him more fully. Certainly, it's an environment which is ripe for you know, research and, and really looking into what some of these cases might might be, what the problems really are. Um, this was a chap who um, uh, who had he's HIV positive. And he developed cryptococcal meningitis. Um, was treated, got better, went home. And he subsequently developed headaches, increasing confusion, and then took to the bed. And you can see here, um, by the time he's come to hospital, um, I don't know how well it projects, but he's extremely thin. He's actually moribund, and uh, he developed um, uh, hydrocephalus as a, as a complication of his cryptococcal meningitis. And you know, things like that uh, are very treatable. That, that is a you know, treatable condition. You've got repeated lumbar punctures and you can, wouldn't uh, have deteriorated to that extent. And you know, it really struck us how many of these um, conditions are very treatable. Neurology is often uh, criticised as a very interesting subject, but there's no real treatment. And I think that's an unfair criticism in this country, but certainly in somewhere like Zambia, you, you, you couldn't make that claim. You know, all these things are eminently treatable conditions. Um, so he had a CT scan here, I've been alluded to before. They have scanners out there now. It's a relatively new thing. Um, and so this is a CT scan. In fact, they even have a, an MRI uh, scanner, a free Tesla MRI scanner. Remarkably, this chap here uh, has an MRI scan of his neck. 
and uh, he couldn't walk, so he came in and he got an MRI scan of his neck. But, but uh, on ex examination, there's, there's no, uh, you know, his strength was absolutely uh, fine. He, uh, um, he um, you know, reflexes and everything were normal and he confused the, uh, the doctors as to what could be wrong with him. I don't know if this is going to play. Anyway, we just filmed some of the bedside teaching we were doing uh, um, with him and he had a uh, very profound ataxia to either lower limb, cerebellar problem. And in fact, so you, you can see, uh, although so he sounds his neck, uh, and there's a little bit of compression there, but in fact isn't causing any of his problems, and certainly not the reason he can't walk. But by coincidence, they almost accidentally included his cerebellum in the scan, and you can see it's severely atrophied. So this shows that, um, you know, uh, now that they have access to this kind of test, it's really important that they have the neurological clinical skills to go along with them. So here this test was, you know, it was inappropriate. They, didn't, they scanned the wrong part of the body. And a, a robust, you know, clinical examination would have demonstrated that. And, you know, the resources in Zambia are so limited. It, to, be, to be doing MRI scans that, that are, aren't necessary is, you know, a huge, a huge problem. It's going to divert resources away from other places. In this case, the, this chap didn't pay for his, his own scan. The um, hospital pay for it. Uh, but in some cases, um, the patients have to pay themselves. And... Um, you know, an MRI scan could, you know, if the doctor told them it was needed, he could bankrupt a family, really. We want to keep doing these things, we want to uh, develop uh, a masterclass. So what we did, we did a lot of teaching, we were kind of teaching all day, every day, while we were out there, various different years. But um, what we'd like to do is develop um, something more comprehensive, something more structured. So for the, um, the junior doctors, the doctors that are on the, the ward seeing the patients, um, something that uh, takes them from the examination, through the conditions, very much with a, a, a neuroinfection focus, because that is what the focus of neurology in, that, in, in those environments is, um, all the way through, and it's, a, and it's a, a complete course. And obviously, also while we're there, supporting the teaching of the undergraduates and these, these clinical officers who are out there. Um, and doing this is building on work that other people in the group have done. So this is a Laura Benjamin's slide. She spent uh, two, over two years in Malawi, um, uh, uh, and she, while out there, developed some a neurology teaching program, and uh, um, together with Sui Wong, who was visiting, uh, developed a syllabus, um, a, a sort of curriculum for teaching neurology in, in, in these places. And also um, um, building on work that's done by uh, Rachel Neen and, and others uh, with uh, paediatric epilepsy teaching. So there, um, <coughs> the um, um, paediatric, paediatric epilepsy training, which is a, a UK course, and seeing if it can be applied internationally. Um, and they went out to Nepal, um, and um, uh, there they are uh, out in Nepal, run the course, and it was a, it was a great success, uh, and um, they're planning to, to, to do that annually. And I think our, you know, what, what we would hope to do would be a you know, similar sort of framework to build on that and you know, what they've learned through from that experience. Uh, just uh, as a side about epilepsy, we didn't really talk about epilepsy in Zambia, so uh, this is um, uh, uh, Patrick Zimba, who, uh, Anthony Zimba, who is a clinic, clinical officer who is specialised in epilepsy. And he's done an enormous amount for epilepsy in, in Zambia, uh, including setting up this retreat uh, for, that epileptics can go to and sort of help grow crops and, and look after things. So it's a fantastic thing that he's, he's set up. Um, the, so epilepsy is uh, looked after by the Department of Psychiatry. So what is epilepsy? You know, it's not caused by witchcraft or spirits, etc. But So trying to, to get rid of some of the stigma around uh, epilepsy um, when to uh, and to, you know, to try and get rid of these kind of uh, ideas when to do so you're going to a psychiatric hospital uh, you know, it's, um, it's a difficult thing to do and of course most, most of those uh, at least a large portion of those uh, epilepsy patients will be posting epileptic epilepsies um, so this is uh, besides Tom's given us as well um, to emphasise uh, other work that we're doing uh, in terms of um, e-learning and supporting people through uh, online resources so this is um, uh, the Liverpool Outcome Score, which is a, a way of um, characterising the disability post-encephalitis, um, was developed by Penny Luthwaite and others. Um, and um, there's this, these onla uh, online um, resources to help um, teach people how to use those. And indeed, we've um, been, been mentioning it earlier, the um, Neuro ID e-learning resource we've got online now. So all these different um, uh, neurological infections, including a lot of different, uh, including a lot of different causes of encephalitis, um, and uh, you click on the media, it looks something like that. Um, and uh, this is how, if it's interesting how you access this, it's the Brain Infections UK uh, website, you can get a little 
e-learning tab there. And um, so I think, you know, together with the, running these courses, we want to build the um, uh, e-learning resources um, to, to support those courses. Um, you know, we were struck by how, you know, often um, there may not be uh, you know, textbooks or certainly not up-to-date textbooks. There wasn't really much in the way of a library in, in the hospital in Lusaka, but all the, all the doctors had laptops and internet access and, and half of them had smartphones as well. That's just, that's just the, you know, the way that, that these things are changing and I think that um, this is the most appropriate way to sort of support those courses and provide uh, training in that environment. Okay, thank you.